everyone. Welcome back to the Waffle Press Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Diego Crespo. With me today is no one. I'm just here to talk about Comic-Con because Gene uh, didn't show up today. Uh, but he did, however, update the Instagram for the Waffle Press. So go ahead and follow that and the Twitter. But uh, it, looks like, it looks like he had fun. Uh, I, I wouldn't know. No, because he's not no. here. Oh, oh, I'm hello. Back. Gene's not here. Just, oh, just arrived. Oh, I just you, yeah, in the this, train station. It's my water. You don't get it. <laughs> how, how how was Comic Con? I guess you didn't take me back. It was very tiring. It was very. Uh, it was very uh, on my feet all day. Exhausting, but I had fun. You know, thanks for texting me back. Now <laughs> I look like an asshole. Welcome back to the Waffle Press Podcast again. I'm your back. host Diego Crespo. Is it though? Yeah, it is. Is it okay? <laughs> What'd you do without me though? I would have just been like. They're making more Marvel movies. Did you did you know that? That's it's like I hate them. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't hate the Marvel movies. I'd, I'd still probably kill to make one just because I like the paychecks. Yeah, and uh, I bet those are pretty good. So we're going to talk about that today on the show, San Diego Comic Con. We don't really talk about movie news anymore. But again, no, this not, is not this really. is Universa, and was, we're going to give him a semi proper introduction. So what, what, what was your time at the con like? Let's spend like a minute. Yeah. How did it, it go? Did you say hi to mutual podcast friends? Yeah, of course. I, uh, I came in Thursday, Thursday morning from Union Station to San Diego. Um, it's always cool. I didn't do preview night, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, I had the full con experience. So ran into some good friends of the show, Andrew Salazar. We were hanging out. We uh, hit up some panels. We... Uh, we uh we uh, were causing uh, ruckus by the Snyder, release the Snyder cut. No, no. <laughs> the the graphic there so there was a gra- there was a bus stop mm-hmm. that had a graphic for release the Snyder cut, and uh, we uh, just had to do it to him. So, um, of but uh, yeah, it was, it was it was fun. It was also not by any foot traffic. So mm. yeah, um, and you didn't find the bar with the cheap drinks. You right? did not find the bar. One day, one year, we will find that again. We will find that. We'll Two dollar shots, there you go. dollar beers. Um, so it's pretty good. Yeah, saw Patrick Campbell for a little bit. Good to see him. Um, yeah, it was uh, good to see everyone. Um, it's always it's always fun at Comic Con. There's you know stuff to get into. I felt like there wasn't enough offsite stuff this year though. Mm-hmm. It's just too weird because even I, I I didn't end up going this year. But even I was like, yeah, I might stop by because I heard there's a lot of stuff they're going to have around the con. But, oh, mm-hmm. oh well, it happens. Uh, also, speaking of Patrick Campbell, I will be on the Patrick Campbell show by the time this goes up, probably. I'm recording like the day after this, so it'll be up around the same time. Mm-hmm. Link down below if it's up before. If not, I'll add it later. So yeah. just stay tuned to that. Uh, good friend of the show, good yeah. podcast. I like those guys. Mm-hmm. Patrick, specifically, but also Patrick Hogue, who's there, who was not at Comic-Con, no. I imagine. Yeah. You know what else happened at Comic-Con? What did? Lots of stuff, I guess. Marvel movies. Yeah, they're make they're TV making show. more. Uh, there's a lot of TV shows. Are you, are you? What are you excited about? Uh, you um, know what? Let's hold off on that because yeah. that'll that'll finish off our introduction. Sure. What excited you the most from Comic Con? We don't talk movie news anymore. Yeah. Let's, let's get nerdy as fuck right that now. That was announced. Mm-hmm. I would say. The... Well, do you know stuff that wasn't announced? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, we got scoops. Yeah. I'm be an ace reporter. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, the Blade announcement. Really excited. No, 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 not, not Marvel. Oh, not Marvel not related. Marvel, yeah. yeah, the um, the Top Gun trailer looked pretty pretty cool. I will say, um, you know, it seems fun like the original movie. Um, uh, Picard looked very interesting, um, but like really excited me. I would say probably. Uh, Trying to think. Say cats. Say cats. No, Just that do was it. even that was that was so odd. That topped Cat, everything. It topped. Cats topped top the news from Comic Con. That's how like that broke the internet. Everyone was just so like horrified as a community <laughs> that online. They're cats, but they, they're people. They're cats. They're they're people, but they're cats. And this is kind of blowing my mind. And James Corden's never understood what's happening at any given point in time. So, thank you, James Corden, for that amazing soundbite that I'm never gonna forget. Um, that movie looks horrifying. It looks terrifying. I was watching it on the train and like I couldn't stop laughing. Everyone was like looking at me. I oh, I'm opening night, baby. I'm going. Yeah. I'm gonna be not sober, <laughs> but I'm gonna love it probably. But I would say uh, I think that most excited was probably Watchmen, HBO show. I mean, I don't know. I don't think you're too hot into that, but I think it no, looks, I'm not, looks, but looks pretty interesting. I'm in glad people are excited. Damon Lindelof is a very good showrunner. Okay, that's yeah. what I got. 
It's like, yeah. The cast is great. Yeah, I mean, cast, it, has, the cast it, it has an interesting cast, and it's like, it's interesting. I, I think it's in the movie's universe. I don't know. I saw the trailer, so there's yeah. like an image of, Visually, it kind of, of squids similar. like hitting a windshield, and that was the thing that tipped me off, like, oh, this is this might not be the movie universe, mm -hmm. or they might just like pick and choose. Yeah. You know? There's another adaptation where they did that recently, and I, I can't remember it off the top right. of my head, but I thought that was kind of neat. I, I don't need it to fit in one universe. Yeah. Anymore. But I felt it was interesting that it's like, it's a story taking place like in between panels, you know, giving us that weird alternate, alternate uh, universe Watchmen's known for. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Moore is probably angry. Alan Moore's <laughs> always angry. He's always angry. They had a they had a weird offsite experience for Watchmen where uh, you could become Doctor Manhattan. I would. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're something was like you you know put it on your Instagram or something. But they were giving out like Watchmen waters. <laughs> And I think I saw uh, someone put out a tweet where he's like, man, it's like Alan Moore just angry at the world right now with these Watchmen waters. Oh, I'll go like pray to his snake god about it or something. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I think it's, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it'll be good, but um, I'm definitely intrigued. That's uh, more than I could say about a lot of things. Yeah. Um, I guess let's get into it then. Marvel. Uh, back when we first started the show, we kind of touched on news and stuff. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, we think about this or we think about this or like, oh, we're sometimes lucky enough to be in the know and be like, well, looking forward to that. Don't look forward to this so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, everything's subjective. Look forward to whatever you want to. So subjectively, Marvel Phase 4, apparently this is it. That's their lineup. Mm -hmm. um, Shang-Chi. I'm just going to talk about the movies. I, I probably won't be checking right. out the shows. And that's, uh, that's yeah. odd that the TV shows were part of the Phase 4, which yeah. never um, happened before. With any no, of but this was part of the thing where they're like, we're launching Disney+, Plus. Kevin Feige, what Marvel stuff can you give us? And it's like, well, we have these ideas for movies, but... They, they're not going to cost $250 million, so we're not going to make them. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm being a little cynical, but that's basically what sure. happened. Yeah. Um, so you get the Falcon and Captain America, or Captain America and Winter Soldier, Falcon, Winter Soldier, whatever. Yeah, he's, he's Captain America now. That's cool. Yeah, um, Wish he was a character. Hawkeye show. I love Hawkeye, and I love Kate Bishop. Mm -hmm. I'll maybe check that out one day. I don't know. WandaVision, other stuff. But the movies are Shang-Chi, Black Widow. Thor, Love and Thunder, which is the greatest title ever, alongside Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Which is like which second is greatest. The second greatest title ever. Um, what else is there? Those, uh, I think that was just... And Blade. And Blade. Blade's not in Phase 4, though, they said. Oh, okay. Blade so will come along with Fantastic Four and X-Men. Out there. There's probably like two movies we missed in there. Yeah. But, uh... Oh, Eternals. Eternals, Which yeah. uh, I'm very excited for. Yeah. Not because I care about the Eternals, but because I like the cast. They're such a... And they're very, like... That's a deep cut. It's, yeah. it's a super deep cut, and I'm pretty sure that's how they're going to try to introduce the X-Men. But also, mm -hmm. director Chloe Zhao directed one of my favorite movies of the recent years, uh, The Writer, that came out last year. Mm -hmm. um, everyone it's go watch movie. that. Yeah, you should. Uh, she's, she's basically like if you got I think I mentioned on the Avengers Endgame episode that she's like if you got Terrence Malick to direct an Avengers movie like what's that even going to look like <laughs> I don't know but I'm we'll very see. excited we'll see we'll yeah. see we'll, we'll, we'll she's definitely. awesome um, I will say I don't know if you were hyped on Shang Chi but it has the director of Short Term 12 Short Term 12 mm -hmm. is a really good movie. amazing yeah. and look at the cast Lakeith Stanfield Brie Larson one of the guys from the newsroom who's actually really talented, uh, um, oh, Rami, Malek. Rami Malek, like uh, Stephanie Beatrice from uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine, like what is those Caitlin like? Dever mm -hmm. is like that cast is like impeccable. That director knows how to like make a movie. I heard he made another movie that wasn't as hot, but like if you make Short Term Twelve, you basically have like my loyalty. So I'll probably check out Shang-Chi, too. I mean, we do this show. I'm going to yeah. watch all of them. It's what just did, like... What did you think of the real Mandarin? <laughs> Which was hinted at um, in that short film. Uh, so that idea has been bouncing around for a while. That idea has been bouncing around for a while. I'm not crazy about You're it. You're not crazy about it? None of these movies will be as good um, as Iron Man 3, probably. Yeah, no, I'm just curious so. why. Because um, I'm like, well, that's cool, I guess. Like, I'm not yeah. like, oh, okay, that's cool. I don't know. Are they trying to cut ties with Shane Black? I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't think they're trying to... Do you feel like it's, like, course correcting too much, or...? Yeah, because yeah. they do what the, the audience wants, like... Right. I mean, OJ, did you watch Endgame? Can I say things about it? Yes. Okay. It's like, when Captain America picks up the hammer, it's like, yeah, that's cool. But, like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to the characters. So it's like, yeah, that's cool. Of course Captain America picked up the hammer. And that's, like, it. And then that's, that's cool, and it's awesome. Right. I agree, but it doesn't mean anything. So, like, oh, yeah, we want the real Mandarin. You, we heard you guys. We'll do it. And they're doing it. Cool. I don't know if it'll mean anything. We'll, yeah. we'll see. 
Um, the actor, um, his name is escaping me, that's Shang-Chi. He, uh, I don't want to get it wrong. I believe it's Sam Liu? Yes. Okay. okay. I like him. Yeah, he's great. Um, yeah, he seems like perfect as a character. I don't, I don't know enough about the character from being honest, okay. but well, I, I like, like the, the actor. He's the world's greatest martial artist in the, oh, in the cool. Marvel Universe. Where... Iron Fist is weeping. <laughs> that's all right. No one saw that. That's why they canceled oh. the first. <laughs> he's not even the Iron Fist anymore. Oh, well, who, who knows? Yeah, I mean, if I mean those like... those shows are done. Sorry, Daredevil <laughs> Sorry, season three, yeah. rest in peace. It was great. Yeah, it was, that was a great season. I still, um, yeah, that kind of like killed all the, the enthusiasm I had for Jessica Jones. Though. Jessica Jones season three has a very strong ending. Uh, I finally finished it. I'll just say right now, very good send off for the Marvel Netflix shows. I bid them farewell, and I feel like it we'll was never a, see them again. About as good as I could have hoped from that one. Okay. Um, a very fun cameo in the series finale. And we'll good, never see them show. again. No, but... Uh, it's like Daredevil went I don't, back to his home planet. Aw, Daredevil <laughs> just... Gosh. If they were smart, they'd introduce the street-level characters into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like, officially. But they won't, because brand synchronicity, I guess. I don't yeah, know. It, um, but, yeah, the Phase 4 stuff... I thought it was cool, but it didn't get me like, oh, my God. That's, that's insane, like... Was it three years ago where they announced Captain Marvel? I'm like, oh, that's amazing. This is like, well, yeah, I knew they were going to do the Netflix shows. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not that's, the Netflix shows. I knew the, they were going to do the Disney Plus shows. Yeah. I mean, that's cool. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm sure all these could be the best Marvel movies ever. But like, as of right now, I'm like, like I love Mahershala Ali as Blade. Yeah, it's awesome. Like, hearing that he went in, he was like, oh, I'm going to be Blade. And, and they're I, like, I, yeah. I will like, say, I, yeah. Um, I will say people are like, oh, does that make it non-canon? But I'm like, uh, the... Um, um, who is the actress that played uh, Mariah in Luke Cage. She's also in Civil War. Yeah, like, that's and, been a thing. Like, they haven't cared about the Netflix stuff right. ever. And, you know, so. like, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch does Dermammu and Doctor Strange. So, I mean, it's not... Well, that, that one I can get. Yeah, know, but it's like, not unheard of of someone, like, playing two different characters. Yeah, but, I mean, Dormammu and Doctor Strange specifically are, like... They look nothing like each right, other, yeah. even though it is Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, Some motherfuckers yeah. always trying to... I see them. Yeah. Um, if if any they have that line If again. any of these movies end up as good as Blade 2, <laughs> I will... I'll, I'll watch one of them in IMAX. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that won't happen. And though. I don't know. Blade's like really offbeat. He's such an interesting, weird character. But that's the point I wanted to make. I love Blade. I love two of the Wesley Snipes movies. I'm cool with a new actor coming in. Um, I kind of... I'm still not that excited because I don't know who's writing, directing. Yeah. I don't know. Just Blade. Yeah, it's just Blade. Oh. I like Blade. Mar Mar cool, Marshall. cool uh, logo. Yeah, they got for that. I like the the curves and everything. <laughs> um, Wesley Wesley Snipes must yeah. be pissed. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say, yeah, Thor is the one I'm most excited mm -hmm. for. I've said for a long time, Spider Man. You could do the most movies with because you could do like a dozen movies, just day in the life kind of stuff. Thor, you can do a dozen movies because. You can do anything with science fiction and fantasy, and yeah. everyone thinks it has to be like just Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and it's like there's middle grounds there mm -hmm. that I think Ragnarok got very well. Um, so the first one's still my favorite, but I recognize I'm in the minority. <laughs> uh, but the, the the point is, I'm excited for the future of Thor. Yeah, like, and Guardians of the Galaxy will come down the line. I'm cool with that. Yeah, um, Natalie Portman coming back to the MCU is genuinely like crazy like made my jaw drop i was like how did they do that yeah uh, that she, was, i don't was she just she didn't like what was with the character? Thor the dark world like broke everyone right. like that's why chris hemsworth was like he went to talk to kevin feige and he was like hey uh we need to do something because that was like awful like I, i'm not, <laughs> not that's yeah, not verbatim sure. but i think everyone kind of knew that movie didn't work it's not alan taylor's fault according to me <laughs> Oh, no, according <laughs> to him, no. Never yeah. his fault. Yeah. But that's why Terminator Genesis was so beloved. I'm like Rotten Tomato score right here. Uh, not that that's the barometer of quality or anything. But like, I, I think Taika Waititi was like, we'll give you the hammer or something. Which I do power have. Power move. Yeah, it's a power move, but I'm like. Ah, when, she I, pulled I, out, when she pulled that hammer, that was, power, that was a power move. Yeah. She was flexed. She um, flexed. So she's either got a hell of a paycheck coming up <laughs> or she's genuinely inspired by the story. Or both. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Um, I don't want them to go back to the hammer, though. I'm not happy that they went back to the axe already. But, like, I'm game for, like, whatever. You can, you can really do whatever with that character in the world. I would love for it to be a refugee story because 
I don't, like, it'd be kind of interesting. It's like, hey, we didn't get all the Asgardians off Asgard. Or we didn't get all the Asgardians to Earth, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, we never saw Sif again. That'd be kind of a fun thing, I think, to, like, touch on. Like, even if we don't revisit that character, the idea that there are just other people, like, stragglers out yeah. there that need to be rescued. Uh, Tessa Thompson as the Queen of Asgard, or King, um, is awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, uh, bisexual Valkyrie. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Like, no shit, it's about time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, and that's uh, that's great because uh, her uh, that that scene that implied that she was, or no, no, it, it said it didn't even imply they yeah. got cut. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the the most you get in the implication of Ragnarok is that it's her lover that died, and that's why she goes into hiding mm -hmm. when they're fighting Hela. Um, like, like yeah, like just why are you yeah. so afraid of, right, of, of the gays? Right, and it's uh, it's it's kind of. Um, like, um, you know, just the, uh, with some of the interviews where they're like, oh, you know. I mean, they were clearly, like, bummed about it, if yeah. not upset. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's great. You know, it's and Taika Waititi is writing this one, I think, solo. Uh, I really was impressed by Ragnarok's writing. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see what he does. Yeah. He's got a, he, he's got, got obviously got a funny bone, but, like, I think people underestimate what a good dramatic storyteller he is. And right, like, Hunt for the Wilder People, that was, like. I mean, tears. Yeah, but it's like also hilarious. And yeah, that's that's what the best of these are. You know, like they they hit like every little beat. But uh, this is just the introduction part of our show. We have another special guest coming in in the second half that Gene will kind of guide the ship on. So that's, that's our thoughts on on Marvel stuff. Really, mm -hmm. it was that's San Diego Comic Con, but really it was, yeah. it was Marvel. You'll stuff. see. You'll Sorry see two that. of those two, two of those movies. No, I'll probably see them all. We're gonna yeah. talk about them on the show. I mean, <laughs> we're not that popular. I need to get those clicks. You know. So I'm just going to title this, What does San Diego Comic-Con 2019 mean for the MCU? And also an interview with Javier Hernandez coming up right now. There you go. That's it, yeah. Cool. Anything else? No, no. All right, cool, then we're done. Definitely done. Okay, bye. 20 minutes, that wasn't too bad. That wasn't, yeah. Yeah, it was 18 on this side. All right, courtesy of OJ Bachlig. But now, I'm here to welcome us back to the show, where we're not talking about San Diego Comic-Con anymore, but we will be talking about comics. <laughs> So I'm going to hand it off to Gene to yeah, take the reins for this part. So we brought in a guest today. It's a good friend of the show, Javier Hernandez. And Hello, uh, welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's cool. We're all uh, Whittier uh, alumni. And, Don't uh, tell them. I want to keep them <laughs> privacy. Ah, yeah, Whittier <laughs> locals. And uh, it's great to have you in, Javier. I remember um, seeing all your comic book art in some stores in Whittier when I was growing up. And... You know, uh, when the movie was coming out, El Morto, and um, it's cool. We uh, finally uh, met at Long Beach Con yeah. last year and, uh, you know, got clicked and just talking uh, just in that interview. Um, we'll ha probably have the link in the bio they were, um, when we interview you um, just about Whittier and your artwork. And, um, yeah, it's great to you're on the show. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's good to be local. You know, it's always a quick drive to a place like this. So thanks for having me here in the studio. Of course. When I when we first met, you started name dropping like Pegasus Hobbies and mm -hmm. Uptown Whittier Greenleaf. Like, okay, this guy's legit. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> know all the uh, all the Whittier stores and everything. Right back then, right? Yeah, like you said, it's uh, ever ever changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Javier, um, can you tell us um, a little bit about El Morto for any listeners that um, you know were into independent comics and? Yeah. Well, it's a comic I started back in '98. Uh, Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, last year uh, I was doing the 20th anniversary. Oh, nice. Had a little logo made up and such. Um, so it's a comic book I created back then, independent, self-published. I had wanted to do my own comic book character. Um, you know, I grew up on all the Marvel characters like everybody else did. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to do something representative like a Mexican-American culture. Um, back then we didn't have hashtags, you know, Latino represent, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But we were still thinking that. Um, so I came up with this character, El Muerto, kind of based on um, Aztec mythology. A little bit of Aztec mythology, a little bit of Day of the Dead folklore, mm -hmm. kind of combined together and then kind of through a lens of, uh, you know, probably like those old classic Marvel superhero comics, you know, like the cursed tragic hero. Yeah. Peter Parker mm -hmm. comes to mind right away. Mm -hmm. So that, that's basically why I started the comic, and that was back in 98. Here we are 21 years later. Yeah. How's, how's it like keeping it alive for two decades? Keeping a dead guy alive, for, I know, <laughs> the, the dichotomy in all this is, is I love it. Um, no, it's, um, it's almost like I got a renewed sense of drive or purpose, whatever, recently, just looking back at the 20 years, and then also I came out with this, you know, I put it on my social networks, I have this idea of doing like a, 
I've always had an idea of doing like a graphic novel series. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is something you should start at the latest in your 30s or 40s, but here we are. So it's like about 10 books I'd like to do. Okay. I already got one in the can. I got one out, Days of the Dead. I'm working on number two. So we need about eight more after this. So mm -hmm. we'll see, right? It's a long yeah. road, but it's what I want to do. It's the story I want to leave behind, basically. Mm -hmm. Not to get all morbid, but... I mean, you know, suitable for the, the content of the story. Exactly. Yeah, no, here we go again. Exactly. It all ties into, like, everlasting life, everlasting life, you know, living dead, whatever. So, um, anyway, so that's what, I've, that's what I'll be working on for the next easily 10 years. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I don't know if I would do one book a year. So, yeah, we'll see. In 15 years. 15 years. <laughs> yeah, no, I hope. I mean, yeah. George, George R. R. Martin's, like, not done with. A Song of Ice and Fire, and he yeah. started that like in '93. No, no, I'm gonna so. start going through and looking at okay, who, who started really late? <laughs> yeah, so. but on the other hand, I have done this for 20 years. I have done, I think I got like a total of about probably 14 El Marto stories, but they're okay. like, so they're often like real short stories, yeah, like, sometimes little humorous stories or whatever. So, in fact, I'm gonna put those in the collection, mm -hmm. so it's like the first 20 years, yeah, so that'll be out, and then like you know, just get to the graphic novel series. And can you talk a little bit, um, for any listeners, um, for like self publishing? Because, um, you know, all the, uh, all the comics were self-published through your um, independent uh, label. And um, just, you know, what, what, what uh, advice or anything that you would give um, to any, like, hopeful self-publishers? Well, self-publishing is, uh, I guess it's kind of, it's changed a lot in 20 years. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's still, you know, you're publishing it yourself. It's yeah. still about you getting off your butt. And putting your work out there if that's what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. So um, in that regard, that doesn't change. So basically kids or adults, middle-aged people starting their graphic novel series, you just got to want to do it. Yeah. You know, if you're not looking to get a publisher or team up with some other entity, you can do it yourself, self-published, and just figure out what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And there's different ways to go about it. Now we've got the internet, right? You know, you can just publish online. Yeah. Uh, do print. People still love print books. Mm -hmm. You know, people are saying, oh, print's going to be dead in, you know, five years because the internet, like, aren't they selling as many graphic novels as ever? So. Yeah. And then, you know, that era was like, you know, ElfQuest was self-publishing. Yeah. And, um, Cerebus. Cerebus. A lot of the Rockets. You know, did, um, you know, just when that, uh, when other, like, uh, comic artists just started, like, self-publishing, what, uh, what inspired you? You know, it's funny, we're talking about Whittier and we're talking about the old comic shop. My friend John Franco had a comic shop called The Fortune Bookie in the early 80s, mm -hmm. mid-80s, when I, so it was like 84 when I walked in, they're like, oh wow, comic book store. So I remember, I, you know, I'd be buying the Marvel, you know, it's mostly Marvel, Marvel Zombie, right, buying all the Marvel stuff. And he's like, here, check out this new book. And I'm like, teenage, how many words, Teenage Mutant Ninja? Like, what? <laughs> That's like weird. Like, yeah. What is this? And then it's like black and white with a, like gray tones, like, nah, thanks, John, but I, I, let me just get the stack of Batman, Spider-Man, Captain America. So, yeah, I missed the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle bandwagon. Could have issue one right there, right? Yeah. But I bought several copies. Had I known then what I know now, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's always been people self-publishing. I mean, at least since I started, you know, as a, as a kid in the 70s reading comics. But I wasn't aware of it until probably, probably more in the 90s when I started seeing more self-publishing going on. So, you know, I, for me, that was the route to go. I never wanted to be... You know, I didn't want to be the 138th artist on Iron Man, mm -hmm. no offense to anybody out there, um, I didn't want to take my property, my idea, and sell it to Marvel or DC. Right. Because they don't really buy ideas anyway. Yeah. It's not like you bring them an idea, you know, you start working on one of their books, and then you create all these ideas and give them, you know, future fodder for all their huge movies, but, um, so anyway, self-publishing, that's uh, my passion, and hopefully if it's yours, you just make sure you will stick with it, you got to try to learn how to get your stuff out there. Yeah, and, you know, El Marto, you talked about him um, just being this, you know, very Marvel-inspired, um, but I think you think you said originally, like, he was supposed to be part of, like, this Justice League of uh, yeah, that's right. Hispanic characters? Yeah, I'd come up with about, like, four or five characters, because mm -hmm. I also have my own, like, Latino Justice League, like, a group, and then one of the characters was El Muerto, and there was other, you know, I think one was a wrestler and whatever, and Aztec. Nice. And I was like, you know what, I don't want to draw my first book, like, with five characters, like, five starring characters. Yeah. Because then you got to have, like, five villains, <laughs> and then anyone's got to have a supporting cast. Like, that's way too many characters to start off with. <laughs> so, you know, I just kind of looked at the dead guy, right? The, the Del Muerto guy. I go, mm -hmm. You know, I think I can do something with that. I, this, it, there's a lot of dichotomy in, like, living and dead. So I think from there you can get a lot of story ideas as well as, um, you know, just 
tons of story ideas out of that. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, you know, it's you know, it's interesting where, you know, he uh, just the look and the of the character is um, just in this kind of uh, like Aztec, um, and you know, with uh, the, his uh, painting, the face painting. Yeah, the Day of the Dead. Painting. Yeah, which was. Twenty years before Coco ever came out, <laughs> as you much like, as we love, I love Coco. Yeah, you love it, right? Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. This guy no. cries. Oh, oh my God, it destroys me. Wow, <laughs> he got ahead. He said he cries, so he owned it. Right? Cause we're live. No, no, they, they they know what it what it did. No, to no, me. exactly. <laughs> no, no, it is, it is a very emotional film, and it's excellent. And then before that, uh, Book of Life. Yeah, mm-hmm. a couple years before that. So, you know, nowadays it's good to see all this stuff out there. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember about ten years ago, I'd walk into the Target or Walmart and like. Wow, it's like Day of the Dead decorations. Yeah, next to the Halloween, it's like okay, it's happening. <laughs> yeah. How was that like um, when the comic was? Um, you know, when you're getting the comic out there, um, when you know, uh, Day of the Dead wasn't as uh, like prominent as it is now. Yeah, it actually wasn't. Um, it was happening in all the community, you know, the Latino communities, but um, it was something nice to. It was nice to be. I think the first person at least put that in a comic, um, as far as I know, or mm-hmm. definitely to make a comic book hero based on that old Day of the Dead idea. Yeah. So, um, but I remember one time, I think at the first show I did in San Jose, there was this uh, girl, she bought the comics, the comic, the one comic that was out. And then later on, she wrote me a letter. I got a letter in my P.O. Box. I still have the P.O. Box of Tom Whittier on Washington. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Yeah, P.O. Box 718. Um, she was really excited, like, oh, I love the comic, I love the story, I love the character. And um, she was really into, she got into Day of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Like, she had heard about it, but she really got into it because of the comic. And I think she went to uh, she went to some store up there, and she bought all this Day of the Dead stuff. So, so, so the next time she celebrates it, she like go all out. So yeah, she, that was pretty nice to be uh, get a word like that from somebody. Yeah, I mean, you know, and we're both uh, you know we're both Hispanic, and mm-hmm. you know it's cool to you know see you know see how you know this representation uh, started and for um, you know Hispanic heroes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm also the co-founder of the Latino Comics Expo. Mm-hmm. Which we started back in uh, me and my partner Ricardo, uh, our co-founder Ricardo Padilla, uh, in twenty eleven I think it was. Okay. And um, it's a you know once a year comic convention dedicated to spotlighting Latino comic creators, graphic novelists, political cartoonists. So nice. Yeah. And um, uh, did um, and also um, you uh, were you um, sponsoring the East uh, Los Angeles Comic Con. No, no, my friend Peter okay. puts that on. Okay. Um, Nostalgia Comics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm associated with it a lot. I mean, I, I go there. I'm a exhibitor there, and I and I do a lot of stuff at their shop. But no, I'm not a. We're not an official co-sponsor. Okay. I guess unofficially we are. We support them. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, just changing gears here. How is it? Um, be, um, it's been about twelve years um, since the movie came out of Alberto. Yeah, twelve years. Is there any? Uh, is there any stories or anything you could tell us? Um, for the adaption of your work, and how is it like just seeing it adapted? Well, one, one sad update is, uh, you know, actor Billy Drago passed away, what, a few months ago, I think? Mm-hmm. Um, he was like one of the villains in the film. So, I mean, that, not to be morbid about it, but yeah. that's the second actor who's passed away who was in the film, mm-hmm. uh, Michael Parks, mm-hmm. um, everybody's favorite sheriff. Yeah. He was in the film, and he passed away a few years ago. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I don't know why, why I bring up the morbid factor, but... Oh, well, honoring their work, you know, they were great. Yeah. They were great to work with on the set. Yeah, I mean, how was it like working with like Michael Parks? Oh, he was fantastic. I mean, uh, I had to pick him up. You know, I remember getting the email, or I think they asked me the night before to go, "Hey, Javier, um, one of our PAs is out tomorrow, okay. production assistants." So you know, it's a small film, really tight. They go, "Can you pick him up tomorrow?" And I was not that aware of him, to be honest. So yeah, I thought, like, <laughs> picking up an actor. Come on, I created this thing. <laughs> yeah, I go. Yeah, yeah. Let me be a team player. Give me his address, whatever. So the next morning, I am, um, I'm driving. I think it's down Wilshire. He had a little townhouse, I think, off of Wilshire. So I'm late. I'm running late. Like, oh shoot! I'll oh, get this guy pissed off. He's the sheriff, Michael mm-hmm. Clark. <laughs> so I called him on my cell, my flip phone at the time. <laughs> hey, Michael. Uh, this is Javier from Del Muerto Production. I'm picking you up. I'm running a little late, and, and I hear his voice. And you know, you hear, you see an actor, you know, catch up on his work. Then you hear the voice like that. It's him. He's like, where are you at? And I told him to cross street. And you can hear him mentally trying to, so, okay, well, you're nearby. Just take your time. Don't kill yourself. Mm. <laughs> it's like, that was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> so I drive up to the address, right? And he's up on the porch. Mm-hmm. He's wearing like jeans, like a green t-shirt, plain t-shirt. 
And he's got one of those funky, like those nylon, those cheap nylon jackets that we yeah. all have. He just like, a, like I was picking him up, we're going on a job, like, <laughs> that's why I, I felt so relaxed though, right? Yeah. It wasn't like this pretentious actor, like, uh-huh. cracking the whip. You're late. He gets in the car, he, he throws his script on the dashboard, <laughs> real casually, he sits down, we start driving, and, you know, I had to introduce myself. So, Michael, I don't know if they told you, so I'm actually the creator of the comic book that the movie's based on. He goes, that's so. And he, then he pulls his script again, and then he looks at the front cover, you know, based on, he's oh, no. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh-huh. You know, he says something like, you know, you're very lucky. This doesn't happen this easy, you know, these movie deals. So he was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And as we're driving, he asked me, um, so do you mind if I smoke? And I hate smoke, right? especially when it's in your car. It's like, no one smokes in my car. So I said, yeah, because, you know, it's like, well, I want to oblige the guy. I go, sure. <laughs> hope, it, hope my face didn't show anything. <laughs> and he pulls out his cigarette pack out of his shirt pocket. And then he, uh, he flips open the ashtray really quick. And then he closes it and puts them back. He's all, you know, nobody smokes in this car. So I was like, wow. Because, you know, he, he realizes, okay, this is a non-smoking car. Yeah. He caught me. Wow. But I thought that was such a classy thing. Yeah. Because wow. I think anybody else would be like, hey, I'm an actor. I can smoke. So anyway, um, I dropped him off. And I dropped him off, walk him to the set. And then I'm walking away. And he's all... Sounds like a little kid. He's like, hey, you take me home? <laughs> I thought that was awesome. You know, like, well, I go, I'm not sure because now, you know, I think they'll probably have a lot of PAs tonight. And, yeah. Um, I should have taken him home. He's such a coolest guy. Yeah, I could have had uh, Michael Parks as your co-file. When we're talking I would have brought him in tonight. <laughs> no. Exactly. Sure. Well, not tonight, but. Yeah. All right. Um, but after the film was done, like, you know, I'm not one of these starstruck guys. They want to hang out with celebrities. But I go, man, I wish I would have kept in contact with him because he, I'm sure if I would have called him, he, he, he loved hitting the bars. I'm mm-hmm. not a big drinker, but I'm sure if I told him, let's go, he'd go, oh, let's go. Just to, just to hear him talk. Yeah. Um, but anyway, people always thought I hung out, hung out with Wilmer after the movie. Mm-hmm. People always ask me. I go, no, we never see each other. But Parks would have been my, my buddy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like been oh, like, yeah, me and Michael were hanging out the other day. I so so. It's been drinking buddy or something? Yeah. <laughs> he would have got me drinking hard probably. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that's just one story out of hundreds of, of working on the film. But it was a... It was, uh, you know, it's like a dream, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't say dream come true because it's not like I was... I didn't create the comic like, oh, God, I hope I get a movie made out of this. You know, that wasn't my goal. That wasn't my... That's not why I did it. But it happened, and so it's great. So it's like a dream that you never thought you had. Because mm-hmm. it was a fantastic experience. Yeah. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. Would you ever consider writing a film? Or is comics, like, where your heart really lies? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I respect the screenwriting process, so I don't know that I, I could even step into the shoe of like trying to you know, just structure a whole 90-minute movie that would make sense through and through. <laughs> um, but I would, I would mind getting more adaptations made out of it. You know, back then, 15 years ago, whatever, 12 years, there wasn't Hulu, Netflix, mm-hmm. <laughs> there wasn't streaming, there wasn't all these appetites out there that got to be fed by all these new media, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, you know, it'd be um, you know great to um, you know follow up with the movie or something. If yeah, movie or like most people are keep saying like, oh no, you gotta do a series. Yeah, <laughs> people will say binge Al Muerto for ten episodes mm-hmm. or whatever it is nowadays. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. That's it's the like thing, right? mo- like we're movie guys and TV guys, but yeah. a lot of people are like, no, TV, TV, TV. Yeah, no, like, no. What? Yeah, it's that's... funny. I hear that more now. Back then, it was like get a movie. Now it's like no, they just they, they just say Netflix. Actually, just get a Netflix. Get a Netflix. So. Netflix yeah. after watching this? No, yeah. Not, anybody out there that knows Netflix? <laughs> I, mean, I, I have had actually like one inquiry and then also, you know, I have my own web shop on my site. Sure. And then, you know, when you, you get the order, you always check the address and, you know, and there's been at least one or two like production companies ordering the book, book from there. So, I mean, you never know what comes out of that. Yeah. Like I said, though, it's the appetite out there to fill all these new channels that have to be, you know, constantly showing new material so mm-hmm. and then I mean, it's good for anybody who's creating yeah. even if it's just a script or whatever oh of course and you know it's it's really cool that you know uh, like on Marto it's uh, just one of the one of the uh, first couple of like Hispanic um, like superheroes as well um, yeah I mean he's in the lineage of it and because if you look at like what's the first Latino superhero at least from in America I mean I, I always point to like the White Tiger at Marvel mm-hmm uh, Mid seventies, and um, there was an independent comic, self published, called um, El, 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 El Lampago. Oh, okay. Self published by a judge. Yeah. Like an actual judge 
from Texas. Huh. <laughs> yeah, like in the late 70s. He did mm -hmm. like three issues. That, isn't that crazy? Like, yeah. he, I guess uh, from what I read, the reason he wanted to do that, because as a judge, he'd get tired of having always sentenced Latino, young Latinos, right? Yeah. For some stupid thing they did. So he figured, well, what if I make him a superhero? Maybe that'll help somehow inspire, you know, young Latinos to, you know, not get into crime or whatever, so... Um, but, and be, you know, before that, what, Zorro, you could consider Yeah. Zorro. But yeah. I was, you know, in the late 90s, there was already a small movement of, uh, you know, Latino creators and even like, you know, people of color, but there was a lot of Latino creators creating their own thing mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. So that kind of inspired me. Yeah. I mean, I, we're, we're big, uh, Robert Rodriguez fans on this podcast too. So that's yes. like a... Yeah, I, got, I met him early on. Uh, I think he was promoting maybe Desperado. Oh, nice. And decided to have him sign my book, oh, Rebel nice. Without a Crew. But yeah, that book's a great... Oh, I love it. It's like... I tell anyone, even a self, really... uh, cartoonist, a comic creator, read that book. Mm -hmm. It's about, yeah, it's about making a film, but it's really about trying to make it on your own with, no, you know, little resources, whatever, so... Yeah, and, you know, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's crazy. He, sell, he, uh, he sells his body to science. Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> a good that headline. That, <laughs> and that's the truth of the story. Yeah. yeah. And the, did you see, uh, I don't know, if, uh, just a little topic, you saw Alita? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing. No. It was amazing to see him what he could do with a huge budget. I don't know what the budget is, but it was, yeah. it was obviously huge. It's a Cameron film. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was like an Avatar budget. Yeah. And, like, it looked it, though. No, like, no, it that's was what I'm cool. yeah. It's great to see him get his hands on something like that. So Yeah, and then um, I think you've done, you've, uh, done a, like a Magna version of uh, El Muerto as well. Yeah, Manga Muerto. Mm -hmm. I did that. I've done three stories on that. I just want to do like a story based on the old, um, these are really old anime, uh, Gigantor. Oh, okay. You know, or Ma Mazinger Z, you know, mm. the, yeah. the kid controlling a giant robot. So instead of creating a new character, I go, well, I'll just turn out Marto to Japanese. He's a foreign exchange student in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I kind of draw more manga-ish, you know, yeah. smaller, bigger head. Big eyes. And he's got this giant robot he controls with the flip phone. <laughs> and so, it's called Manga Muerto? Yeah, the book is called Manga Muerto. That's, that's right. amazing. Well, because so, yeah. you know, in my head, it's like, okay, yeah, it's going to be Manga Muerto. I need a title for it. And I go, you know what? That's the perfect title. <laughs> You know, people like it because it's got a, it's got the dual language, right? Manga Muerto and it yeah. rolls off the tongue. It's like a what if episode too. Uh, yeah, like what if El Muerto was in Japan <laughs> as a foreign exchange student? So, I'm, I'm, I was working on a, on a fourth one, mm -hmm. and it was a full graphic novel. This last one, and then at one point I was getting stuck on like a story point. Um, I wasn't sure which way to go with it, and then I go, you know what? Let me put this aside for now, and then let me go to back to the El Muerto series and do book two. So that's what I'm working on right now. Oh, nice. Um, and how, um, for the uh, the saga of this character, um, do you ever, like, um, do you have, um, like, any, like, storylines that have changed or just throughout the history of the character? Uh, no, because I, I just actually wrote down in my notebook, like, the actual the ten book oh, okay. outline. And I wrote down kind of what I've always been thinking of doing with it. Mm -hmm. But there's some things I'm dropping out only, like, for time. Because I yeah. go, I, I think it would take probably 15 books to do all these character things I wanted to do. Uh, like introduce these new characters and other things. So I just can't, you just have to cut stuff. And no one knows about it because they've never seen it. So, But you, you have to learn how to cut, you know, kill some of your own ideas. So you've got to cut a lot of stuff out. But um, hopefully it's still going to be a very epic involved storyline. Yeah, and you know, I feel like the character is like needed more than ever in like, the, you know, certain, uh, uh, per, certain issues um, going on right now as well. Yeah, yeah no, that's, uh, you know that's a really good that's a really good point to be honest. But um, you know, as a Latino, I don't really in in my comic with the Marco, I'm, I'm not really touching on those necessarily. Oh, okay. And I, a lot of people do. A lot of my friends who do books, Latino characters, mm -hmm. which is fine. Yeah. Um, I for me though, automatically, I don't look at it like as a default thing that you know, oh, you're Latino, you have to do with like the topics yeah. of the day, even the ones that you know, whatever, whatever's the hot Latino topic. Um. You know, it's, yeah, it's, I'm glad you asked, you brought that up because I don't want to come off wrong when I say that, but like when I think of my favorite storytellers, you know, like interviews I read throughout my life, like Jack Kirby or mm -hmm. John Carpenter or Tim Burton, for example, right? And then you read their interviews, I know what the answer is going to be. They, people, someone will say, well, because they're white. You know, all they do is talk about and they're asked about their story, their process, their characters, their influence. Like they don't normally get asked like, oh, what's your political stance on, you know, so-and-so issue of the mm -hmm. day. But when you're a Latino creator, sometimes that happens. Again, I'm not saying that's wrong. 
and people can say, oh, well, the white guys don't have to worry about that stuff. Well, I'm sure they got political things yeah. they talk about. It just seems like a, I don't say it's a pet peeve of mine, but I think it's, it's always worth discussing. It, it seems a lot, though, like a default question or topic is with Latino or black creators. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, so what about, you know, Yeah. and name the top five issues and yeah. that president we won't name right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, yeah, like I have political ideas and I discuss them with friends and even online, but... Um, but work-wise, I just, I don't really, I don't think I really touch on that stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think there's enough stuff in just the human, the human drama to talk about, you know, with the characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got relationships with his ex-girlfriend and current friends and this and that and other people he meets. And then it, it's just fun coming out with these, you know, wild and crazy, you know, villains and evil organizations, whatever. Um, you can probably mask some of that political stuff yeah. as a metaphor, but... Um, as far as like upfront dealing with it, I, I don't think I'll be doing that in the comic for the most part. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm actually really glad you brought that up because like, I, I think it was Ava DuVernay or Jordan Peele who was saying that like, yeah, like people of color creators are always the ones who are asked about like the political stuff. It's like, well, obviously those two in particular are very politically outspoken right, with right. their art, but like, I would, sometimes it's nice to talk about like what you want to do. And of course... Their stuff in particular is influenced by that, but it's of like, course, of course, you know, we're we're people who want to think about other things at the parts of the time too. You know? Yeah, yeah, just as a yeah, like I said, when I mean when I'm deep in an interview with John Carpenter, and it's like, or David Lynch, like man, all this stuff to talk about and how they come up with their ideas and you know mm-hmm. why is this character like this, you know, without having to mention oh, what do you think about that law that just got passed? <laughs> Again, is that their own politics? Like mm-hmm. I said, it's good to be political. I think we shall be. Politically aware, yes. and most yeah. people aren't. It yeah. Seems like. yeah, yeah, and but maybe just, maybe um, they should be. But also, your point, yeah, like that, just just take five, you know, like right, people right. we're human beings we need to like unwind for a second. Right, I'll point you to the cool other Latino creators who are doing that. <laughs> Lalo Alcaraz, you guys, I'm sure know. He's yes, big political big cartoonist. fan. Yeah. yeah, you know, he's a political cartoonist. Hmm. So yeah, his topics, especially now, like all the topics have caught up with his the, what he's been writing about for years. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it's a good question. It wasn't, I wasn't snapping at you when you oh, asked sure, that. Sure. I'm glad you brought it up because I don't think I've had a chance to actually really talk about that. Yeah. I, I always thought it'd be a good panel discussion. Um, you know, get some Latinos who are very politically mm-hmm. motivated in their work versus some who aren't. And I don't think this, he's right and he's wrong. I think they're both valid as long as they're doing their work. So. Yeah, definitely. And uh, just kind of changing gears here, you know, you're speaking of the panel. Yeah, at Long Beach, you were on a panel with uh, Steve Ditko's uh, nephew. Yeah, Mark Ditko. And um, I would uh, I would say, out of all the people I know, you're uh, kind of like a Ditko historian. Yeah. Is that, is that a good term? What, what do they call this? Ditko cultist? Um, Ditko. Yeah, no. Fan, yeah, whatever. Historian, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I love the man's work. He's definitely one of my, you know... It's probably comes it's comes down to him and Jack Kirby. Yeah. As far as like your driving uh, inspiration and things that got you into loving comics and mm-hmm. storytelling. So um, yeah, he passed away. It's been a year now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's like he passed away right before for Comic Con as well. And I know Comic Con's always gonna be like and uh, painted as you know the show died by before. Yeah, and you know passed away the same year as Stan Lee. As I well. know, and Stan follows that like in December. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. And, and you know, I just I love him as a as a creator, as a comic book artist. Um, just the way the uh, his Spider Man is drawn, like it's not muscular, it's just right. lanky, and it's and always bends and really yeah, it's mm-hmm. just all these positions. crazy poses, right? That you know, because that's that's a character. He's just this like lanky teenager, and uh, you know that you know he really understood that character and. Yeah, um, just seemed like he drew maybe a lot from his personal life in it, would you say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, boy, if you look at the first p- drawings of Peter Parker, you look at Steve Dickel's uh, high school photo mm-hmm. album, which you probably see it online. Right. Like, oh, it's Peter Parker. <laughs> yeah, because in that one, like, annual, I think it's like the first Spider-Man annual where he draws, like, a self-portrait. Like, he yeah. kind of looks like Peter Parker. Yeah, but you look at his high school photograph. I mean, yeah. he, th- th- that's, where he drew, that's where he got Peter Parker from. And, you know, it's a co-creation. Like, you know, Stanley Lee mm-hmm. has had the idea for his character. Right. Okay, but like Steve said, well, it's the idea. So here's what he looks like. Okay. Yeah. Here's what Peter Parker looks like. Here's what all the Aunt May, Jameson, mm-hmm. Betty Brown look like. like oh, really, here's all the villains. Yeah, he really fleshed out that world as well. Because what's um, I think there's like an amazing fantasy, like a couple issues before, where they have like characters, like similar to Aunt there's May. An Aunt, yeah, yeah, there's a definitely right. Aunt May look-alike in, in the... So it's like he had like a lot of this like world 
kind of already like flesh out in a way. Yeah, well, like like most artists, you have like the way you're, you know you have like your your models, like your body mm -hmm. types or your faces that you draw. Just change the hairstyle or put more wrinkles on it or something. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's funny when I'm drawing, like I draw one. Uh, Marto and I might draw his best friend Zach. Mm -hmm. So like, you draw the shape, the head exactly the same, but like, okay, Zach's got more wrinkles here. <laughs> yeah. Or, or or maybe he's got fuller cheeks. But yeah, you kind of, in your head as an artist, you got that template. Here's your male figure. Here's your female, and then change it from there. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and then how did um. How did you, um, you, you know, you're a fan of Dicko's work. How did you um, get to know um, his, um, his nephew's, his nephew? Oh, uh, you know, I don't remember how that exactly, who contacted did who. Because he's in a lot of, he's in a couple of Dicko face, Dicko face, uh, Facebook groups. Okay. So we just kind of, you know, said, hi, hey, what's up, oh, you know, just in public. Mm -hmm. And then he reached out to me, or I reached out to him about something. I think maybe I was doing an art show, a Steve Dicko art show in Nostalgia Comics. And I asked him if he, if he wanted to come check it out. And he goes, I gotta, can I put some pieces in there? I got like a Bill Sienkiewicz print he did of my uncle. And then um, Dave Sim did a Mr. A piece. So. Yeah. So they were in the show. So it was, and he, he was at the art show. Okay. It was on Day of the Dead actually last year. Oh, nice. Which is, uh, that's Steve Dickel's birthday. Really? Okay. Which when I was Ooh. creating El Muerto 20 years ago, you know, well, he had to be born on Day of the Dead. Yeah. And later on, I found out, wow, that's Dick Rose Burke. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. It's uncanny. Seren yeah, serendipity. Um, so, yeah, that's how I got to know Mark. And then uh, we were doing this panel at Long Beach last year, um, Steve Dick, Steve Dick Tribute. And he goes, hey, can I come speak? I go, yeah, definitely. So it's me, Marv Wolfman, uh, Dean Hespiel, and uh, Mark. So it was pretty cool. It's pretty cool hearing someone after all these years refer to him as my uncle. Because, you know, mm -hmm. we never heard of a family member talk about him. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's an uncle. He'd, cut, he'd go to the house and jump out from the bush and scare him and his brother. <laughs> you know, yeah. showed him how to play, throw knives, I think he said, it on mm -hmm. the panel. Yeah, and, you know, and it, you know, it also kind of clears up a lot of, like, misconceptions. And, you know, we talked about this in an interview where, you know, there's a, there's like a, st uh, st there's a, just this, uh, like, idea that he was, like, reclusive when he was just, he was a very private person. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a good, I can, yeah, I can see where you use the word reclusive, I mean, because he wouldn't want to be public, mm -hmm. but... His uh, address was in the phone book. Yeah, exactly. And people would send him letters and go visit him. Not that he'd want to answer the door every damn day. <laughs> yeah. you know, right. But he would. Mm -hmm. He'd just slam the door or answer quickly. Or some people would say that, yeah, I was talking to him in his doorway for 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, he wouldn't let me in the studio, but he, at the same time, he is talking. So. Well, was it the BBC um, documentary about him? The, he talked to the guy. He just didn't want to be filmed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because yeah, it's like, you're on my doorstep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> call him up. He wanted to talk to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I think he's just like one of the the greatest like comic book artists of that era. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna argue. Yeah. No, he really is. He's like his innovations and such. I mean, look at the Doctor Strange world and like mm -hmm. you were describing about just the way he drew Spider Man and all those you know sci fi horror stories he did for decades before and after Spider Man. So. Yeah, what, what is um you know because his his Spider Man stuff I'm you know I just I love, but I'm not as familiar with uh, his uh, like Charlton comics or like. The, um, like um, Blue Beetle and uh, Mr. A Mr. A yeah. his uh, self-published stuff yeah there's a whole world of stuff out there I mean people can find those in collections or mm -hmm. um, so I, at Comic Con this last week there's an IDW panel and I guess they're putting together a collection of Mr. A yeah his self-published work he's been doing since the late 60s mm -hmm. so look forward to that yeah and um, I was just going to add um, you know you, there was a uh, well, why do you why do you think he like left like the book after like a like a certain point? He did print. He actually, he did finally print a little essay a couple just about two three years ago. Mm -hmm. It got published in his. Uh, so he has a publishing partner, Robin Snyder. Yeah, who I think's up in Washington, and he's been publishing Dicko stuff for like the last thirty years, self publishing mm -hmm. it. And then he wrote an essay for that. Basically, said why I quit. So that's what he was in waiting for. And you know, he basically said because you know Stanley wasn't talking to him, so he didn't want to work with someone who's not talking to him because they weren't talking for a while button heads a lot on the storyline yeah on the credit right because there was like i think the green goblin identity reveal was kind of he was just like well that's the rumor that's yeah. the story for years but you know if you look at the actual stories and dicko says no i always planned it to be norman Osborn. okay um but you know like the last year of the of the comic if you look at the actual comics the credits it says plotted by dicko mm -hmm. because the marvel method would be like stan would come up with an idea or he would talk the idea over with the artist, like, hey, let's have him fight the goblin and kidnap Betty Brown, whatever. 
So then the artist goes home and draws the whole story, but, you know, just based on that two-word sentence, that's not a whole storyline. What if Deku puts all these subplots? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he brings it back to the writer, Stan. Mm -hmm. So Stan's like, okay, well, this is interesting, so let me, let me write the dialogue to that story. Yeah. So or, who's the writer, or are they co-writers? So, anyway. Yeah, because it's like, you know, there's so many, like, subplots in the early Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, May means... Yeah, Big Brand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She has, like, a brother who's a Multiple criminal or yeah. something, yeah. So, I mean, I think th those books were co-written. Mm -hmm. Or co-plotted. So. Yeah, no, I, and, you know, he's the co-creator of Spider-Man, and, you know, it's... You know, he, yeah, he came up with, like, a lot of the heart and soul of the character. Yeah, it's all the visuals. Every, every, every single visual... Mm -hmm. aspect and trick about it yeah yeah is there any um is there any uh that you can share um any other cool uh deco stories that you might have heard uh well just publicly i mean like the stuff mark has been talking about um like the mr a stories like mm -hmm. i guess dicko didn't want those collected okay but so the brother uh dicko's brother patrick i think that's his name he wants to collect them and he want and he's actually doing a story like a biography on dicko which, again, Dicko's not, that wasn't something Dicko wanted. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what do you do now? Okay, someone passed away in your family. They're famous. Mm -hmm. And they have this great body of work. Do you want to put the story out? Or do you want other people to put it out inaccurately? So, yeah. you know, it's their decision. They might get some flack for it. Like, right. like, oh, but he didn't want that to happen. But it's like, well, you know what? It's the brother. It's the brother's decision. So, yeah. if you don't want it, don't read it. Yeah. But if you want to read the actual story of Dicko, I think the book should be called Steve Dicko, The Man. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and uh, just kind of last topic on Dicko. Um, do you think he would have liked the Sam Raimi movies? You know, I don't know. People <laughs> always ask about that, like, "Oh, too bad he didn't care." Like, he didn't. He says he didn't care about him. Yeah, like he says, like from what I remember reading, like he doesn't care. Like he left that character like fifty years ago, whatever mm -hmm. it was. Now, I don't like the fans keep. Oh, you think he loved it? No, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he was interested in it to be honest, which is. It's hard to fathom for us, right? Because, I mean, I had a movie. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> but he was a different mindset. Like, once he left something, he was done with it. Like, he was done, like, creatively, artistically. Yeah. And he's an he's a artist has to keep looking forward. So. Yeah. Like, he didn't... Do you think he had, like, like fondness for the character? Or just... You know, I don't know if he would ask... If he, and I don't want to speak for the guy. I think he would yeah. not look at it like fondness. Yeah. Like, the way I would with mine. Or mm -hmm. I think he would look at it like, oh, it was a job I had to do. And I did a, you know, I did a job professionally. Yeah. You know, he, he's just a different... He just... Uh, has a different way of thinking and just articulating that, which drives people crazy to make, you know, and <laughs> yeah. make him say stupid stuff that, you know, he's a crazy recluse and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, I think that's actually kind of a, a very human thing to do. I mean, we all look at, like, movies, television, comics, art as, like, oh, that's, like, the dream, and, like, right. yeah, like, for, for guys like us, it is, but, you know, at the end of the day, it is... A job. Yeah. People, bills need to be paid. Yeah, yeah. People got to work, and not everyone's going to romanticize the field. There's nothing wrong with like loving it to that extent, right, but there's right. also nothing wrong with just being like, I like doing this work, but that was one job. Now I'm doing something else. And once I finished for the day, I clock out. And yeah, I, I, I think both of, are valid. I, I've seen pictures of the old artists. This one guy, Sal Buscema, a huge guy from the 70s and 80s. And yeah, I saw a picture of his studio, mm -hmm. and he's sitting there, you know, drawing. And there's nothing on the wall. Like, we would have, like, toys and action figures and pictures and posters. Mm -hmm. He just had, like, pencils and rulers, a coffee cup. <laughs> like, he wasn't a fanboy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though he's drawn, like, thousands of Hulk stories or whatever. He didn't have Hulk action figures on his <laughs> desk. It's, so it's like you're saying, like, no, it's just a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm good at it, but that's what it is, a job. Yeah. And, and I kind of respect that just as much in a way. No, just I, like, I, yeah, I, that's... Because I'm not like that. <laughs> and it's good that people can be like that and still be great at their work. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, did you find, um, do you find, like, any, like, influence in your own artwork of his? Or, excuse me, influence of your own artwork from, like, his style? Uh, yeah, I mean, people see it, and, you know, I, I think when I'm staging the figures, I, you know, I'm thinking of, like, oh, how did a Dicko do this, or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm definitely influenced by the way he, his storytelling, and just the way he structured figures, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, guilty as charged. Yeah, because I, I remember seeing your, uh, your Spider-Man very much in the Linky style. Yeah, well, when I draw Spider-Man, I definitely want to make it look like the way... Yeah. He, like his style. No, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, your Spider-Man looks great, too. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Let me put a, possibly put a picture up right there on the YouTube version. <laughs> right. If not, yeah, then I'm just shaking my hand in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah, I'll wait. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't look like a moron just like... <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there, there's Spider-Man now. I gotta do it again. Every time I do my hand. Spider-Man. Yeah. Or I guess... Yeah. 
Yeah. Was he saying the Raimi movie Shazam? Shazam. Yeah, yeah. Shazam. 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 And then we got a Shazam. Yeah. 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 Shazam. I. Yes. Yes, I, I just saw it recently. I, love, I, love I don't want to run our, our show longer, but yeah, I, I was very surprised by that. I was very happy. Some of the, the books into the studio, is it okay to um, talk a little about them? Uh, yeah. Should I, yeah, yeah no, no, by, by all means. Reach yeah. out and you can pick them up? Yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Just pause for it. Oh, just pause? Okay. Yeah, we'll just... Oh, like, my God. So there's uh, book number one, Days of the Dead, 100 and, I don't know, 30 pages or so. Um, this here, really quick, is... I'm not gonna open it because this is so. This is the book I just bought the other day, a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna map out like the whole graphic novel storyline. Yeah, like all ten books. I, I just showed this image on uh, Instagram. Instagram earlier. Oh, nice. But I covered the. Uh, I covered the. Uh, the titles. Okay. Well, I don't have titles for them, but just the, the mm. quick summaries. Oh, so, nice. Because I have to I have to map. You know, you have to map out what's gonna happen in book two. What subplots are gonna happen? When's it gonna get resolved? So I'll be working on this so I can map out my work. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about Marvel method, so I don't write a script. Like, okay. so this is book two. So what I do for months and months, I'm thinking in my head, what's going to happen, da da da, and then I just finally sit down and I start doing uh, what they call thumbnails, mm -hmm. rough draft. You know, so there's page one, two, three, right, mm -hmm. and then it just you know goes to what? I'm gonna get to a spoiler page here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Non non spoiler <laughs> podcast. <laughs> right, page what seventy Oops. seventy one, and um, yeah. that's right. And la la last page. So this is one hundred four pages. I can show you guys without showing the audience. Okay. So, <laughs> sometimes I change the page number. Right. This was page yeah. sixty eight. When I went back and edited it, and I had to expand it out, so now it's page sixty. You know, whatever. So anyway, these are just you know thumbnails. I'll show you the last page. Okay. But you see how it's really rough? Yeah. Yeah. But then I'm going to redraw it on a larger sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's what I'm doing now. I'm drawing, I've drawn like the first five pages of the book. Nice. So, you know, I got another 100 pages to go. And then I got to scan it, letter it. Yeah. So it should be hopefully out in the spring of next year. Okay. Yeah, it'd be cool to have you back on to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll have book two in my hand and bring it back and show you guys. Yeah. Because it's just, you know, it's just cool to see like just a Latino hero as, you know, was a Hispanic person of color, so yeah, thanks. Uh, no, and it's cool also to see a hero called Diego. Yeah, yeah, I was well, gonna say. Diego. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it, I I feel great about it already. <laughs> well, you know, the reason he's called that Diego de la Muerte is um, yeah, you know, I needed a name for the character, right? Uh, I seek identity. So the first thing I thought of was, okay, Dia de los Muertos. What's the closest thing that, like, phonetically and visually looks like that? Mm -hmm. So I wrote down Diego. Uh, de the other was Muertos, and I just thought, well, okay, the guy's named Diego, and De La Muerte. Yeah. But um, uh, you know, I knew yeah. I was going to be on the show 21 years later. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent foresight. That That's called foreshadowing, people. <laughs> very, very heavy foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> but people ask me, like, is Zorro an influence, right? Juan, was it Don Diego De La Vega? Yeah. I go, well, you know, I, I called him the zombie Zorro at times. <laughs> um, so a lot of things went into influencing it, but... yeah. Cool. No, Mr. Javier Hernandez, thank you very much for coming on the oh, show today. You're very it was welcome. a pleasure to have yeah, you. Thank you thank so you. much for joining. And thanks to where, you. Where me. can people find you on, on the social? They can find me on all of my social networks, which are um, somewhere in the book, or throw them, be, throw them on the screen behind us. Yes. I should remember all this stuff, but we'll put them, yeah, yeah. Here we go. But yeah, just put them up on the. Uh, yeah, I'll put okay. I'll put them up on there because there's a couple. Because they're all different handles. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything you want to tell that camera right there before we sign off? Uh, yeah, everybody. If you're creating stuff. Do it no matter what, no matter how hard the odds are. If you really want to see it in print or in film, just please do it. Well, thank you right. for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, Gene, your stuff will be right here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to say it or do you want to just show uh, up on the screen? Uh, just show up on the screen. Okay. My stuff will be right here. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Javier, again. Thank you, Gene, for setting this up. Thank you for being my co-host. Thank you, OJ, behind the cameras. Thank you for providing all the space. Thank you to the patrons, people on Twitter, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, uh, Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We have been professionally unprofessional.